So today's video is going to cover uh, bacteria and their genetics and how they're able to get variation within them as well as start to introduce some of the biotechnology. So we're going to start with this uh, clip on antibiotics so we can see how bacteria are able to get some antibiotic resistance okay, and how the variation can lead to that. Before the 1940s, in battles between bacteria and humans, bacteria often won. We had no weapons against pneumonia, meningitis, tuberculosis, and other bacterial infections. Then, in 1928, a happy accident began to turn the tide. A scientist named Alexander Fleming went on vacation and returned to find a single mold growing in a petri dish where bacterial cultures once flourished. The mold had killed the bacteria, but Fleming couldn't reproduce it. With the help of other scientists and 10 years of target practice, the newly discovered mold named Penicillium was ready for war. In World War II, penicillin slowed the assault of gangrene, and antibiotics looked as though they could rid us of all sorts of deadly bacteria for good. Here's how antibiotics work. When a serious infection sets in, white blood cells, a body's natural line of defense, may be overwhelmed. But antibiotics fight back and kill the bacteria without harming human cells. Even in the face of medical assault, some drug-resistant bacteria survive and multiply. What's more, we're trigger happy. Over 18 million antibiotic prescriptions are written each year for colds, which are caused by viruses and unaffected by these drugs. We also feed farm animals antibiotics to make them grow, though no one knows just how the drugs speed growth. Today, 50% of all the antibiotics produced wind up in animal feed. So we're promoting the evolution of super bacteria resistant to more and more antibiotics in our arsenal. More than a third of bacteria causing pneumonia are drug resistant. Doctors like Stuart Levy suggest the following prescription. We should not demand them of our physician. We should use them as prescribed. We shouldn't stockpile them, and we shouldn't give them to other people. If we do just that, we will prevent the overuse and misuse of antibiotics and will eliminate a major, maybe 50, 60 percent of the problem of resistance due to antibiotics. So that little clip there talked to us about how bacteria are becoming um, resistant to antibiotics. And the three main ways that bacteria are able to fight off an antibiotic is that they either have membrane proteins that will um, act as efflux pumps. And so by an efflux pump, we mean that they're going to actually pump the antibiotics out of the cell. Okay. The bacteria could also have um, enzymes that degrade the antibiotic, so they essentially break the antibiotic down, okay, or they erode it away so it doesn't work anymore. And the other way that bacteria could be resistant to antibiotics is that they, again, produce an enzyme, but in this case, the enzyme uh, changes the structure of the antibiotic. And remember, if we lose structure, we usually lose function. Okay, so these are the three main ways that bacteria can be resistant to antibiotics. Again, membrane proteins that act as efflux pumps, and they just literally pump the antibiotic out of the cell. Uh, they produce enzymes that either degrade the antibiotic or change the structure of the antibiotic. Okay, and so the bacteria that have these antibiotic resistant, 
resistance, they're the ones that are going to be able to reproduce. There are basically three ways that the, anti that the bacteria can become resistant. They can either have natural or inherited resistance. A, they um, were born with some sort of resistance, whether they had a mutation that they were born with that gave them that, or their parents passed on their DNA that produced uh, the enzymes or produced those membrane proteins that made them resistant. A, um, there could be acquired resistance. A, and so with acquired resistance, the bacteria was able to gain the gene that makes them resistant from another source and incorporate that into its genome. And that's going to be a, a big focus of our video today is how uh, bacteria are able to share DNA. And so over its lifetime, the bacteria could acquire or get the DNA that codes for the resistance from somewhere else, from an outside source. Um, another way is through random mutations. Okay, and so with random mutations here, okay, it's thought to uh, believe that one in every 108 to 109 bacteria uh, develop resistance when they're exposed to an antibiotic, which doesn't really seem like that big of a deal, except for the fact that bacteria reproduce so quickly. And because they reproduce so quickly, um, those ones that are re naturally resistant are um, reproducing very quickly. And so all of the offspring are going to have the resistance now. So we're going to look at different types of what's called horizontal gene transfer now. If y'all remember we mentioned uh, the horizontal gene transfer um, either on the last video or the one before. Basically it's moving the trans transferring the genes from one organism to another. So um, from one bacterial cell to another cell. And so uh, the first one we're going to talk about is what's called transformation. Okay, and so with transformation, the bacterial cell is going to take up uh, foreign genetic material that is in uh, basically around it, okay, that's in the environment, and it's going to incorporate it into its own genome. Okay, so it's getting this bacteria, it's getting this DNA that is, like I said, it's in the environment around it, like when we... Um, We'll talk some more of the biotechnology and we'll talk about how uh, we can use some organisms to make things for us. Okay? And it's because they'll pick the DNA up that's in the solution around them. Okay? And so that's going to be the transformation. So we can see here, this is an example of uh, transformation taking place. This is the Harvey and Chase experiment. If you all remember this one with the R cells and the S cells. Okay, and so the living R cells were mixed with the heat-killed S cells. Remember the, um, so we had living S cells, and those are the ones that were virulent, or those are the ones that were infectious. Remember they killed the mouse. Okay, living R cells didn't do anything to the mouse. Uh, heat-killed S cells didn't do anything to the mouse. But a mix of living R cells, which are supposed to be cells that don't cause any problems, and heat-killed S cells actually kills the mouse. It results in living S cells, and that's because of transformation. When the two are mixed together, the R cells incorporate some of the DNA that is um, used to make the S cells be infectious. Okay, and so that would be an example of the R cells picking up that DNA from their environment and incorporating it into their own genome. So the second kind of uh, horizontal gene transfer is what's called transduction. Okay, and so transduction is when viruses transmit prokaryotic genes from one bacteria to another. They infect a bacterium, okay, and when they infect that bacterium, they may pick up some of that bacterial DNA when they are making their new viruses. And so their new viruses um, would contain the viral genetic material as well as the, um, the genetic material from the original host cell. Uh, this experiment here shows that the DNA is what gets injected into the um, bacterium, not the virus, okay, um, which is how it's going to result in genetic variation. So again, the transduction is a result of virus transmission. The virus, um, the virus infects one bacterial cell. As it's being assembled, it may pick up some pieces of the bacterial DNA, you know, catch it in the capsid as it's being assembled, 
And then when it goes and infects a new um, bacterial cell, it will transmit that DNA that it picked up. The third type of horizontal gene transfer is what's called conjugation. And with conjugation, you have one bacteria that's going to send out what's called a sex pilus. And a sex pilus is basically a mating bridge. Um, it's essentially a link between the two bacteria. So one bacteria sends out the sex pilus, which will attach to the second, and that will bring the two together. And now they've got this bridge between them where they can exchange genetic material from one to the other. If you look at the experiment down on the bottom, uh, you can see uh, what's called an F-plasmid exchange. So a plasmid is a circular piece of DNA. These are found in prokaryotes. Okay, it's a circular piece of DNA that's separate from the chromosome, and it's able to replicate all by itself. Okay, you can see the plasmid here in this particular cell. It's not part of the bacterial chromosome. And as you can see here, okay, it's a double-stranded here, and it's replicated. Okay, it can replicate on its own. So in this case, the F plasmid is actually what codes for making the sex pillus. And so this first cell here, what's called an F plus cell, it has the F plasmid in it, and the F negative cell does not. So the F plus cell is the one that has produced the sex pillus and formed the mating bridge between the two. Okay? And so once that um, mating bridge is complete, the copy of the F plasmid is now able to transfer over to the second bacterial cell now making the second bacterial cell an F positive cell. So now this second cell here is able to reproduce, is able to produce a sex pillus. Another form of genes transfer is through the use of transposons. Okay, it's called transposition. Okay, and so with transposition, these are also sometimes called jumping genes. And so these genes are basically mobile along the chromosome. And so these jumping genes, these little DNA segments, they can be transferred from one place to another along the chromosome using either a cut and paste or copy and paste um, mechanism. So in this case here, this is my transposon, this little piece of um, DNA. A copy of it was made, okay, and it's been inserted somewhere else along the chromosome. And so it has, quote unquote, jumped to a new location. You can also have what's called a 